even in intense pain for 16 weeks, four months, a third of 2013, even in that intense pain, our family has felt the favor of God. And we felt the favor of God because of your prayers for us. And I want you to know that we intend for the rest of our lives to spend the rest of our lives comforting others with the same comfort that we have been given from God because of your prayers. Our hope is firm because we know. And what I want to say is that what you know is what, you get, what gets you through in life. If you don't know the right things, when the rogue winds of life come and the tsunamis of life come, you're gonna fall over, you're gonna cave, you're gonna crumble. And when the great tragedies and the losses of life, which are inevitable, come into your life, if you don't know the right truths, you're not gonna stand spiritually strong. What you know is what gets you through. Probably the question I've been asked more than any other question is, how is your family getting through this? And the answer is, it's because of what we know. Because our lives are not built on the shifting sands of popularity and popular culture, which changes every month. But our lives are built on rock solid, bedrock truth of the Bible, so that no matter what hits us, we have a solid foundation. We know some unchanging truths. Today I wanna to just mention three of those truths. Now I don't like to say this as your pastor because I love you, but you're gonna go through tough times and you too will experience major losses in life. There is no growth without change, there is no change without loss, there is no loss without pain and there is no pain without grief. You're gonna go through losses in life and you need to know these things that we're gonna talk about this morning and you need to remember them to make it through. How do you get through what you're going through? Let's, let's get right into it. Number one, the first thing we know is this. Uh, we know that life doesn't make sense. We, we, we know that. Life doesn't make sense, but we know we can have peace because we know God is with us and he loves us. Life doesn't make sense, but we can still have peace because we know God is with us and God loves us. Now you have noticed, I'm sure, that life is often confusing. There are a lot more questions than answers, and there are a lot of unanswered questions. And the, the truth is, we simply don't know why things happen the way they do, and we're not gonna know. But we're always asking the question, why? Why is this happening? Why is this happening now? Why is this happening to me? Why, why, why? Why did my husband walk out on me? Why did my wife die of cancer? Why did I lose my job? Why didn't I get that promotion? Why was my baby born with mental illness? And we're not gonna know on this side of eternity the answer to those why questions. You're just not gonna know. Life does not make sense when you just look at it. Bad people prosper, good people suffer, and all kinds of different things happen. You know, in my grieving, uh, I'm not just grieving, but I'm observing my own grief because I'm a teacher. And as I looked at what I was going through, I, I could see six discernible stages of reaction to loss. You might write these down, because you're gonna go through them, and you can go through them all at once, and you can go back and forth, but here are the stages, what I call the six stages of loss. Now the first one is shock, shock and that your world is just thrown upside down. You lose your job, you're in shock. Uh, a loved one dies, you're in shock. Ma the shock over Matthew's suicide lasted not days, it lasted at least a month in my life. At least a month. And I was in shock for a month. But then you move to stage two, which I call sorrow. You move from shock to sorrow, and now you begin to grieve. Now sorrow is a godly emotion. Shock is a purely human emotion. God is never shocked because God knows everything, so God never goes, wow, didn't see that one coming. <laughs> so God is never shocked, that's a human emotion. But sorrow is a godly emotion. 
The Bible says God grieves. The only reason you're able to grieve is because you're made in the image of God. The Bible says Jesus wept. The Bible says Jesus was a man acquainted with sorrows. He understood sorrow. It's, grieving is a good thing. Grieving is the way we get through the transitions of life. Then you move from shock to sorrow, and the third stage is struggle. Now in struggle is where you ask the why questions. Why, why, why me, why now, why this, why did this happen? And all. Now, you're not gonna get the answers to the whys, but it's still okay to ask them. Even Jesus asked why. On the cross, Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why? Even Jesus asked the why question. Because we don't always know what's going on in that moment. So it's okay to ask why. But the test of your faith is, what do you do when you don't get the answer? Because you're not going to get it. The fourth phrase is, if you want to get out of the struggle into peace, you've got to go to stage four, which I call surrender. And in surrender, it's where you just stop asking and start submitting and start surrendering and start accepting. Surrender is the only path to peace. It is the only path to peace. And you just say, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it up. I'm gonna give it up. Then you come to stage five. This is a big Bible word, but it's the word sanctification. Sanctification is when God starts bringing good out of bad, when God starts making changes in you, when your personality, when your character starts being transformed like the metamorphosis of a caterpillar into a butterfly. Sanctification is when God makes you more godly. Now you're never gonna be God. You're never gonna be a, a God, not even a little God. People say, you know, New Age Movement says, you're a God. Oh really? If you're a God, why don't you solve all the world's problems? You can't even solve your own. You're not a God, you're not even a mini-me God. <laughs> but you can become godly where you become more like God in love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, all those qualities, the fruit of the Spirit. And then once you get into the sanctification where God is working on you, then you come to stage six, which is service. And it's this, God wants to take your greatest pain and turn it into your life message. He wants to use your mess for a message. He wants to use your test for a testimony. He wants to take the thing that you're most embarrassed about, that you're most ashamed of, that you most regret hadn't happened, and he wants to use it for good in the lives of others. Who can better help someone, parents of a Down syndrome child, than parents who had a Down syndrome child? Who could better help somebody struggling with an addiction than somebody who struggled with an addiction. The very thing you want to least talk about is the very thing God wants to use most in your life to help other people. Your ministry comes out of your pain. But what I want you to get today is this one concept. No matter what stage you're in, you're not in it by yourself. You're not alone. God is with you and God loves you. And that's why we can have peace even when life doesn't make sense because God is with me and God loves me. You're not gonna go through any of these stages on your own. There's a second thing you need to know and you need to remember. Everything on earth is broken. Everything on earth is broken. But we can still have joy because we know God is good and he's got a greater plan. Everything on earth is broken. Now, the fact is, since sin and evil entered the world, it messed up everything. And nothing on this planet is perfect. Everything on the planet is broken. Nothing works perfectly. The weather does not work perfectly. We have tsunamis and we have earthquakes and we have fires and floods and all kinds of natural disasters. God didn't want that. He created a garden of paradise, a garden of Eden. Sin broke the planet. It broke the weather. It broke the climate. The economy doesn't work perfectly. None of your plans work perfectly. Have you noticed that? Not one of your plans works perfectly. Every, everything is broken. Well, if everything is broken, how can we have joy? Because we know God is good and because we know he has a better purpose 
and a greater plan. Romans 8, 28, one of the greatest promises in the Bible says this, but we know, circle that, we know. We know, this is the second thing you need to know. We know that in all things, not some things, not the good things, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. Now, this is a great promise, but I want you to notice it's not a promise for everybody. everybody. He works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. If you love God, everything that happens in your life, God is using it. He's gonna work it for good, even the bad. Anybody can bring good out of good. God specializes in bringing good out of bad. Now, if you don't love God, All things are not working for good in your life. In fact, all things are working for bad in your life because you're going against your creator. And that's gonna, your arms are too short to box with God. You're gonna lose that one. On the day that Matthew died, we were suspecting because we hadn't heard from him all day, he hadn't texted all day, that our greatest fear had probably happened. The day I prayed would never happen. The day I feared might, that he would take his life. We went over to his house and we couldn't get into his house because we didn't have a key to his house. His car was there and he wasn't answering the door and and we were worried that our deepest, greatest fear had happened. And as we stood there in the driveway waiting for police to come to to break in and to see uh, what inevitably was true, Kay and I stood there in in the... driveway, hugging each other, sobbing. Our hearts were breaking into a million pieces. And as we stood there trembling and sobbing out loud, Kay reached up and grabbed her necklace, which had two words on it, and she showed it to me. It was the words of a book that she wrote, the title of a book she wrote a year ago, Choose Joy. And I thought, are you kidding me? How in the world do you choose joy in the deepest grief? How do you choose joy in the worst pain? How do you choose joy when your greatest fear is being realized? You see, friends, the epidemic of our day is hopelessness. People are living and dying without hope. It is an epidemic of all proportion. The biggest problem on the planet is not poverty. We're trying to do something about that in the peace plan. The biggest problem on the planet is not disease. We're trying to do something about that in the peace plan. The biggest problem on the planet is not the lack of education, ignorance, and illiteracy. We're trying to do something about that. The biggest problem on the planet is hopelessness. It's hopelessness. People are living without hope. It's why Purpose Driven Life is a bestseller everywhere and It's the most translated book in the world except for the Bible because people are hungry for hope. You can go go days, you can go weeks without food. I could probably go months. (laughs) You can go days without water. You can go a few minutes without air, but you cannot live without hope. Matthew's death came in the middle of an enormous battle with ho- of hope, for hope, in my life. Five days earlier was Easter, before Matthew died. I had just preached 14 services to about 50,000 people on the hope of the resurrection. And I had poured my heart out talking about the hope of heaven and the hope of resurrection and living with hope. The, on Monday, the day after Easter, we announced that after me saying no for 32 years, that I was gonna allow my team to put my messages on the radio nationally. And we launched on the Monday after Easter a program called Daily Hope. On Tuesday, I announced that I was gonna take a four month sabbatical and write the first book since Purpose Driven Life, major book, and it was gonna be called The Hope You Need. You, you see a pattern starting here. Sunday, the hope of the resurrection. Monday, launching daily hope. Tuesday, starting on a book called The Hope You Need. Wednesday, I sent you a news and views and said, uh, this weekend we're starting a new series on hope 
and I'm going to be doing a message out of First Chronicles uh, 20, uh, Second Chronicles 20, uh, on uh, what to do when you feel like you're under attack. On Thursday, Christianity Today magazine published a major article about the peace plan and our intentions to take the message of hope to 3,000 tribes uh, around the world that have no Bible, no believer, no church. Little tiny tribes. And the article was called Rick Warren's Final Frontier. And it was about taking hope to the world on Thursday. Friday was the day Matthew died. The message that was playing on the radio, Daily Hope program that day was winning the battle for your mind. Now we often think when something happens, a major loss happens in your life, we often think, this is the end of the world. It's not. It's the end of a moment. And in your life, you're going to have many ends of a moment. I don't know what you're going through, but I want to tell you, no matter how bad it is, it's not the end of the world. How do I know that? Because when the, end, the real end of the world happens, Jesus comes back. He shows up. It's not the end of the world. It's the end of a moment in your life. One day, there is going to be an end of the world. God's going to settle the score, even the odds, show justice and mercy. And the Bible says, here's how it's going to be. One day, all our grief's going to end. Revelation 21, verse 4. The very end of the Bible. Then God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death. And there will be no more mourning. And there will be no more crying. And there will be no more pain. For the old order of things will pass away. That's the hope. Now what in the world do we do in the meantime between the dirty now and now and the sweet by and by? What do we do during the middle part, during the parentheses? We live in peace even when life doesn't make sense because we know that God is with us and he loves us. And we live with joy even when everything is broken because we know that God is good and he has a greater plan.